Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today, um, well, is hypermedia actually. But uh, because the the you know the sort of secondary theme or one of the the themes for tomorrow is around, yeah, I need the long one. That's the the issue. <laughs> we I can chain them all together. Um, so the. Uh, the, because of you know one of the the things we're talking about tomorrow is is around um, the the language of APIs and and, and um, language APIs themselves and and um, uh, and, and uh, natural language processing. I thought that you know hypermedia would be an interesting thing to cover. It's not something that I would usually present about. Actually, I leave that to you know uh, people like Mike and, and Steve and, and a bunch of other people that are. Um, well-known experts in this space, but um, I thought talking about this idea of a, a Babel fish would be kind of interesting. How, how many people are, are familiar with what I'm actually talking about when I say Babel fish? Yes, reasonable number. Yeah, so I have to confess it's been quite a while since I've read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, but just to refresh everybody's memory, um, a, a Babel fish, you possibly can't... Um, see the, the text here, but it's, it's basically uh, a small yellow leech-like um, uh, creature uh, that can help you understand any language. So it basically you know, feeds brainwaves into you and can under you help you understand exactly uh, what some other uh, language is, is, is being spoken, so you don't need to naturally understand it yourself. <clears throat> and then the, the, the other part of the, 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 the story is the swamp of pox. And so I'm going to, I'm leaning heavy, quite heavily on, on a variety of people's work here to, to kind of talk my way through this story this morning. But um, the swamp of pox really comes from um, this uh, maturity model that Ren Leonard Richardson put together um, around um, rest. And so the idea, we're going to come back to, to each of these phases, but the swamp of pox kind of being the, the beginnings of, of web APIs in this world where it was plain old XML or SOAP-based interactions um, and, and uh, things like that. So I guess why? Uh, why are we here? I, I, I kind of wanted to, to talk about the beginnings of the web. And, and so it was actually back in 1990 that uh, Tim Berners-Lee and um, uh, Robert uh, Keayu uh, put together this proposal that defined what the web was going to be and, and what it's actually become today, what we actually understand the web to be. Um, and, and there was a variety of pretty key and, and valuable concepts that were um, laid out in this, this thesis, this proposal for the web. One of the key aspects is that um, even if a client and server have never really uh, met each other before, to, to, to use um, part of uh, Mike's little uh, story of, of discovery, um, is uh, you know, the, the idea that they, they will still be able to talk to each other. They'll actually naturally understand each other. So um, they should be able to interact successfully. There's no you know, predetermined notion of, of what a client and a server needs to be per se. And in this case, obviously, the client being the browser. And, and one of the other key things that we're going to come back to is this notion that um, you should be able to browse at will. So the client can you know, effectively discover or meet a new server and understand it and browse through it. Um, and so one of the, the, the key concepts that's really important here is linking. And so Obviously, this is you know, leading us down a path to understand the, the premise and, and, and foundation of what um, the glory of rest is all about. But I wanted to pause and, and kind of understand a little bit about you know, where, where are we right now and, and kind of think about um, the beginnings of, of many people's um, web APIs and this notion of HTTP because Really, this is the foundation of web APIs um, for most of us, regardless of, of what style or, or, or implementation you've actually, uh, uh, you know, whatever path you've gone down. And so I guess that I have a kind of a question. Um, what is HTTP? You can just tell me what it stands for. Really simple. Really simple question. Okay, right. 
Of course. So, that uh, seems like an obvious answer, but in reality, I kind of wonder, do we really think of it like that when we use it? There's a pretty key word in here, and I don't think we necessarily use HTTP in the context that we, you know, it was always intended. I think, in actual fact, many web APIs are actually doing it more like a how-to-transfer protocol, right? They're not thinking about the pretty fundamental piece of the story or the, the, the uh, actual interface or specification here, and that is hypertext itself. Hypertext is really the most important part. And so um, this word is, uh, has been around for a long time. Uh, it was actually um, Ted Nelson back in around 1965 that they came up with the, con the, the term hypertext. It was long before uh, the notion of, of the World Wide Web, for sure. And it was basically you know, this notion that a file, it's, it's uh, you know, a, a, a way to link, a text that links to, contains links to other text. It's quite a simple concept. Um, and it's been a, a, adapted and adopted within the world of, uh, of the World Wide Web. And by extension, then hypermedia is a term used for hypertext that's um, not actually text, so other media types. Okay? I'm going to take another step back for a second and think about how we use the web and, and, and what, you know, how you actually interact with it. Uh, let's consider like a web application that everybody's very familiar with, uh, the Facebook application. So I can actually browse to you know, HTTP, Facebook.com, and uh, discover and navigate and, and use the entire web application without really having to know anything about it. I don't need to know exactly where links are. I don't need to go from uh, to understand exactly where the next page is or, or the exact URL of of my friends or a particular post or whatever it might be. I don't need to know anything about it. I just need to, to, to discover it as I use it. Um, so the web is actually more than just HTTP then. Um, it's, it's, it's got its foundations in this, this thing of hypertext transfer protocol. Um, but it's actually, a, it's, it's actually three different things. It's HTTP, it's, it's URIs, the, the links themselves. And then it's HTML. It's this uh, document format that describes media, that describes the, the, the document, the, the content itself. And so we need to use all of this um, in the web. That's what the, the, you know, the web is all about. We, we, you have to embrace all of it. You can't just use one little part. Um, but I wonder, have we kind of forgotten this in the world of APIs? I think that. Uh, uh, you know, going back to this notion of you know the how to transfer protocol. Um, you know, a, a web a, the web is really not a, a, an idea of like one client talking to one server. It's about being able to offer an unlimited number of, of clients or, or you know an uh, infinite number of clients to, to talk to an infinite number of servers. Um, and and linking is the foundation of how this actually works. So let's have a quick reminder. Um, the, this REST maturity model. So we kind of, I think, you know, discussed what the, the basis of, of the swamp of pox was all about. But I'm going to start from the beginning anyway and work our way towards the, the glory of REST. Um, I'm, I'm borrowing some, some graphics from, from a few blogs and, and people that I've, you know, I, I like to read because, uh, well, uh, anybody that knows me will know that I'm a marketing guy, I'm not an engineer, I don't write code every day. So unlike Mike, who though didn't present us any code today, I'm going to show you code even though I'm not a coder. Um, I was a computer science guy once upon a time, but it's been a little while. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, the, the swamp of pox as level zero. Um, the starting point using HTTP as a transport system, you're, you're not using any of the mechanisms of the web here. All you're doing is using HTTP as a tunneling mechanism, right? So you're, you're using a simple remote procedure call to, to go from one place to another. And to take an example, um, you know, just a basic SOAP um, implementation of uh, this uh, scheduling uh, API, 
This is what an example plain old XML or SOAP interface might look like. So to help us understand how we get from the beginnings, the level zero, up to the, the, the level three vision for REST, I wanted to, to represent some of this some of these APIs as web pages to help people understand how you get from level zero to level three. And so if I was to look at this, this is like the, this is the representation of this API as, as a human readable rather than machine readable interface. So you interact with all of the interactions on this page by uh, its, its sort of root um, page. The entire uh, website is actually a a static content file, it's just a text file, there's nothing um, you know, to interact with here, there is no hypermedia types here at all, there is no HTML content being used. So uh, if we were to interact with this, I, I have to figure out where to go next, what do I do next? So uh, if I want to actually take that service and create uh, uh, an appointment based on the API that was defined, um, I, I have to append all of these actions onto the end of the URL. And I have to do it all myself. You know, as a user of this web page, this is all I can do because there's no linking, there's no hypermedia, there's no, there's no content um, to, to help me figure out what I need to do next. There's a contract that defines what the API is, but there's, there's really nothing else. Um, and uh, so I have to uh, you know, manually input everything. So this is the, the basics of a plain old XML or level zero type uh, API. Um, and you don't get, uh, you're not using HTTP in its entirety here. Um, you're not, uh, for example, you're, you're actually creating something using a get method uh, because this is simple uh, web browser representation of the API. Um, you don't get the benefits that uh, you know, an HTTP, HTTP client actually gives you. Um, for example, you know, warning the user that uh, you know, re when you resubmit the data, you're, you know, refreshing the page is going to uh, cause you some problems. So there's a whole raft of issues using this uh, uh, style, let's say, um, if we think of it in a web page context. So the next level up from this is, is, is this notion of resources. So the next step is, is to, to introduce resources into the world. So rather than making all of our requests uh, to a single service endpoint like we did in the, the plain old XML world, we're actually starting to think about individual resources. And this is, this is obviously a good thing. So I can think about you know, the doctor and I can think about the, uh, the, you know, the patient and the appointment and, and have very distinct um, resources defined. So if I put this again into the context of a simple level one uh, API, you break up that same API that we had before into uh, different resources, as we can see here. So doctor, its ID, the slots available, and their IDs. Okay. And so you're still using one HTTP method here. We've not changed anything except adding resources. That's the definition of level one according to the, the Richardson maturity model. If I was to look at that then as a web page, um, you're still uh, uh, making your users construct their URLs by hand because there's no hypermedia here. There's no linking. There's nothing to tell me um, you know, what I should do next. Do I really have to? Do I have to you know, manually add things onto the end? I don't understand that. That doesn't make any sense to me. And so this you know, kind of continues as you go along. So here's the, you know, we get to. Um, appointment page, here's the appointments that are available, um, and uh, then we can actually see here's the specific appointments for this date, and here it's telling me that here's the action to use in order to create um, an appointment for this particular resource. So it's a slight step forward, uh, but it's quite a small one in reality. Breaking down your API into multiple resources gives you things like addressability, um, uh, but you know, the, the reality is uh, you're still forcing people to, to, to you know, manually construct their API um, every time. And in a web world, obviously that's not how the world works. The next step is probably uh, where 
most of us in the room today are at. Okay? So in the previous levels, we you know, always used post um, or always used get in the case of the web browser example. And um, it didn't really make much difference because they're both being used really as, as a tunnel, right? We're not, we're not leveraging HTTP in its entirety. We're just using um, the, you know, the, the, the basic mechanisms of the web browser. Uh, level two moves away from this by using HTTP, HTTP verbs correctly, or at least as closely as you possibly can um, to, to how they're used in HTTP itself. So let's take a look at the same API, but adding on the next layer. Let's think about um, the specifics. So um, we should be uh, getting um, the, you know, the, the doctors or getting the, the available slots, for example. And uh, so you, the, you're actually you know, leveraging very specific verbs. But you're still using a static media type or just a plain text file in this case. Or, or in the, the API example, it's, it's a, a JSON format. Um, the web page world um, is still completely flat text, no linking, no um, HTML, no hypermedia types at all. So the issue here is you're actually using out-of-band information um, to tell users what your API can actually do. And uh, to, to, to leverage um, you know, the, the discussion that Mike just uh, gave us, um, the, the, these are the affordances, right? We were not telling people anything about how to use the API. The affordances are, are totally described in some out-of-band mechanism. And so um, you're literally asking them to read the page and construct a post request um, to do something uh, different. So, uh, you know, so the, the browser doesn't you know, naturally understand this. You're, you're, you're still you know, forcing people to create everything themselves. You're not leveraging the tools and the definitions and the capabilities that are built into HTTP and things that, well, naturally, uh, a web browser, the client in this world, actually understands. And so you know, this would be an example of linking and forms. So um, this is still not really the, the perfect vision. So if I you know, go get, again and question, what does your APIs look like today? Um, you're, you're probably in this world. And, and so I'm kind of showing the APIs that you've you know, worked blood, sweat, and tears into as something that's still really quite basic and, and um, not really that useful. And if you came across a web page like this, you wouldn't be interested in interacting with it because it's not, it's not familiar. It's not easy to use. It's, it's not discoverable. And so uh, you, you, you know, you're, you're still not leveraging everything that's available to you. You don't run into double submission problems anymore because the browser knows that um, you know, a post is different from a get and there's you know, it'll ask um, the user whether they want to resubmit a non-safe operation. So leveraging that, the, the HTTP verbs, is actually helping you some way along, but it's not perfect. So let's think about what hypermedia actually gives us then. Um, the, the final level introduces this, this concept, and it's, it's called um, hypertext as the engine of application state, or hypermedia controls. and so. It's quite a long, uh, you know, long-winded way of saying, you know, leveraging all of HTTP, leveraging all of the, the, the services and capabilities and definitions of, of the web. So let's look at uh, an API in this, uh, in this context. So what, with uh, hypermedia media types like HTML, um, you're start starting to intermingle or or, or provide the data and the control in the same message. So rather than having to have some out-of-band definition of you know, where you go next, you're actually providing links to, 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 to point people to the, to the right place, where to go next, what's available to you, what are the affordances of this API, what are the capabilities of this API. And so this is really the foundation of the, the really core concept of, of what hypermedia is all about. And, um, you know, again, if we were to look at this in a web context, it's starting to be much more familiar to us. There's no manual for your users, right? There's no need for people to, 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 to have some kind of uh, out-of-band definition as to what I should do next. 
there's uh, just this natural um, ability because I know I can click on that link, I can go there, it's, it's, I can figure out what I should do next. It's just all presented to me in an easy, familiar, um, and discoverable way. And, and so the message, like we said, has both the control um, and the, the content. The next piece is, is forms, right? The, the idea of you know, providing a way to actually capture data. And there's, again, defined media types to, to, to figure out what you're putting into these specific um, forms. So uh, that's the, you know, the stepping through the, the world from plain old XML through into uh, you know, level one APIs, the addition of resources in level one APIs into uh, HCP verbs, and now this, this concept of hypermedia controls. And so what I, what I really want to emphasize here is this is really using all of the web, right? The idea that coming back to uh, web page examples, you can't, you can't you know, uh, make do with just one small piece. It just doesn't make sense. It's not familiar. It's not easy. It's not scalable. And, and so we need to, to think about you know, what we're actually doing at each level. So in level one, we're tackling the question of, you know, breaking the service endpoint apart. And I'm, I'm borrowing from Leonard Richardson here because uh, what he talked about is this notion of, of dividing and conquering and breaking services down into multiple resources. Level two introduces a standard set of verbs that we understand. And so we're not, there's no variation, there's no miscommunication. We know exactly what we have to do next based on the, the appropriate task, the appropriate verb that's being used. And then level three introduces this concept of discoverability. And this is really the, the, the foundation, the key point, providing a way to, to, to naturally link a step to, from one place to the next. And, and you know, the, the, the API, the service, becomes self-documenting then in that sense. I don't need, like we said, some out-of-band separate definition for what it does. The API is telling me what I have to do next. It's showing me. The, this uh, rich set of affordances. Um, just because we used a few examples and, and, uh, and, and different things along the way, I wanted to point out um, XML or HTML isn't the only way a resource can be uh, represented. Um, so you can kind of make that decision based on you know, the implementation of your API itself. But, but you have to remember the difference between um, a sort of static format and a hypermedia type, right? So HTML versus text in our world of the web page example. Um, and then, I guess, in, sh in short summary, we want to understand, well, why, why did we do this in the first place? What were the foundations? What, why did uh, you know, the web adopt this particular model? And there were some really good principles or requirements that were kind of designed in from the very beginning. It needed to be scalable, right? It's not just one client and one server. It needs to be many of many or an infinite number of each. It needs to be recoverable, so we're not uh, you know, doing uh, strange things um, by using the wrong um, HTTP verbs, for example. Fault tolerable, secure, and then a key thing here, uh, especially in the context of, of enterprise um, services and, and, and the idea of you know, being able to, to develop things that are you know, loosely coupled is really important. Uh, traditional RPC style APIs can actually enforce coupling. You're, you're expected to know what to do next. You're, you're inherently connecting these two things together and the client has to understand it. So hypermedia actually gives us this capability to be loosely coupled. Um, and these are the same requirements, obviously, that we have for software systems. You know? So the, the foundation of the web, the principles that, that make it work, that, that make it you know, something that's, that's definitely not going away, um, are, are the same things that we should be in, uh, introducing and, and implementing in our uh, software systems. So level three uh, REST supports all of these requirements by using all of the web. And I, uh, this is really the short summary. Um, I know that uh, you know, hypermedia is one of these perhaps uh, you know, unknown quantities that uh, sounds confusing or, or, or complicated, but uh, in reality, uh, it's just about embracing the concepts that we know and love and understand really well. So it's not that confusing or complicated. It's just the basics of how the web works. 
Um, I have to give some credit to the, for the graphics that I uh, uh, begged and borrowed from um, a little bit, because like I said, uh, me trying to write you um, some XML or JSON APIs from scratch may have been um, less than entertaining. Um, so just uh, some interesting uh, pieces to go and look at in the future. Um, and uh, that is it from me. Um, so thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Russ. Uh, thank you very much. We have time for a few questions. So I will begin by the first one. Uh, Russ, just mm. so you, you, you work with a lot of companies, right? Indeed. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, but but when, you, when you go see some, I don't know, customers or when your teams go see customers, if you can make a kind of percentage of what you see in the industry, how many are on the swap of bugs? How many are on the resource level, HTTP verbs level or happy media level? If you can make a... I think it's a very good question. I think in reality, especially in the enterprise uh, context, there's still a lot of uh, SOAP style APIs out there. And I'm not going to belittle that or make it seem that those should go away or be replaced in some way ultimately. What's, you know, what's working for you should, you know, there's no reason to, to change something that isn't naturally broken if, if, uh, if that's you know, what you've got in place today. So we still see quite a lot of, of SOAP based or plain old XML um, uh, interfaces. Uh, I think for people that are starting from the very beginning that don't have the baggage of you know, legacy um, infrastructure or are trying to, to, re, to, to you know, restart their API from scratch, then you know, they're starting to think about a RESTful API from the very beginning. Um, and in that case, I would say 99% of them are level two APIs. I think I can think of one or two customers um, that uh, we work with that are now you know, fully embracing the world of hypermedia. And they were total skeptics originally, I think. But um, yes, only a small number um, that I know of right now are actively embracing the world of hypermedia. Most people are in level two. OK. And what, what arguments convinced them? Why did they choose? It was for you know, documentation-less or well, distributed? Well, yeah, so or? the idea of, of something being, you know, re requiring less documentation for sure. But I think the, the, the primary um, concept is this notion of, of being loosely coupled. And so moving away from, you know, a strict, highly governed architecture of services. And perhaps somebody's going to be talking about microservices a little bit today. And, and hypermedia, I think, plays into that story very nicely because, you know, they, they need to be small, lightweight, loosely coupled things with bu very bounded context. And hypermedia actually allows you to implement that. And so um, some organizations are starting to take that step. And we've seen you know, huge successes from the likes of um, Amazon and, uh, and, and, a, and a whole bunch of others, Netflix, that are, that are you know, real leaders in that space that you know, have embraced the world of hypermedia, for sure. Yeah. We have time for one last question. Uh, don't you think that uh, maybe uh, embedding this kind of flow inside the APIs, you are uh, substituting the, the role of a developer building that flow by, uh, by her own or by her own? Well, I think, you know, again, by using the, you know, the example of, of web-based interactions, you're still defining the, the developer of the API is still defining what those affordances are, what those things that you can do, um, you know, the definition of those. And, and so, uh, you know, th there could be a variety of next steps. It's not like there's always one next step. You can go into a variety of options. So just like how you interact with a web application, you know, you can choose to do a bunch of things next. And so I don't think you're putting a whole lot of limitations on the developer. You're just showing them, here are the, the things that you can do. In the same way that a, you know, a WSDL contract of old would have shown you, here's a bunch of things that you can do. It's just a more dynamic way of doing that. OK, Ross, thank you very, very much. Thank you. <laughs>